The Olympic Show on OTB Sports with Indeed, proud partner of Team Ireland. Yeah, you're welcome along to our Olympic show here in Off the Ball. It's Monday, 26th of July. It is day three of the Games. Our Olympic show is going to come at you every weekday, certainly just after five o'clock, Monday to Friday, weekends as well, across Saturday and Sunday's shows. It's all with thanks to Indeed, who are proud to support Team Ireland at Tokyo 2020 Olympics. Indeed believes the world works better when people are given every opportunity to unleash their true talents. Hashtag talent unleashed. Where do we start? Well... The answer is very simple. We start with Mona McSharry. She is the uh, shining light for the Irish on day three. I think that much is safe to say. 20 years of age from Sligo. This is her uh, very first Games. She's in college over in the States at the moment. And you'll know Mona, I'm sure, if you're keeping an eye on swimming, even generally in this country, a stellar junior career, junior world champion in 2017. So we knew to expect the big things. And boy, is she delivering. She has made history. She has reached an Olympic final. Uh, Michelle Smith, the only other Irish swimmer, male or female, to make a final. So the 100 metres breaststroke final, 3.17 a.m. is when you want to set the alarm clock for uh, Tuesday morning. So 3.17 a.m. is when the 100 metre breaststroke final gets underway. Very happy to welcome in Carl Dennehy from Tokyo. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good late night, I suppose, as it is over here. How are you? What time are we over there for you? Uh, about quarter past one in the morning, so I'm hanging. Okay. Busy day? <laughs> yeah, quite busy. Um, got around to, actually only got to the, in terms of Irish, only got to see Liam Jagu today in the canoeing, and the rest of it was kind of done as uh, a lot of journalists end up doing when they get sick of the media buses. They sit in the main press centre with about 100 screens in front of them and just file their reports from there. So that's what I ended up doing for the, the latter part of the day. Let's talk Mona McSharry. So she's an, an extraordinary uh, history-making afternoon she clocked in at 6.59 seconds just 0.3 off her irish record and the extraordinary thing is this was tense she made the final by 0 0.01 of a second one hundredth of a second she uh, elbowed chelsea hodges of australia out of the way so like i said along with michelle smith the only irish swimmer male or female to make an olympic final this is absolutely extraordinary from 20 year old mona mcsharry it truly is. I mean, as you mentioned in the intro there, anyone who's been following swimming to any degree in the last six, seven years would have been very familiar with the name Mona McSherry. She was very much the child prodigy world junior champion. Obviously, at 17, she won a rake of European medals. And I guess there was a lot of pressure on her, you know, these last few years. She was winning things like, you know, the Irish Times or Irish Independent or RTE Young Sports Person of the Year. And that always kind of puts a tag on you but she's handled it so well. I mean, to come, I, I think a good move for her is probably to go over to America at the University of Tennessee. She's come on leaps and bounds since she went there. I mean, she's carved up the Irish records from the 50 meters to the 200 meters in the breaststroke and in the butterfly as well. You know, she's basically done it all. But I think coming here to her first Olympics at the age of 20, I mean, 20, I suppose, isn't that young in swimming terms. There is a 16 and a 17 year old, I think, in her final tomorrow. But at the same time, it is clearly, you know, the very much the spring of her career. And she could have like at least another games, if not two or three more games in her. Um, and yet to have made a final, I mean, like I was just writing in the newspapers earlier, it, you know, swimming is has a reach across the world pretty much you know in a huge swath of the world's population and for an irish person to have made an eight woman final is just truly astonishing and her age i guess at 20 makes it all the more impressive but i guess people who are following it would have seen that this was coming you know her coach at tennessee she won an ncaa bronze medal this year and i suppose for anyone not too familiar with the ncaa system that's basically the best of the best college talent across the united states in division one and she was third in the, I think it was, it was the 200 meter breaststroke actually, she won the bronze medal there. But yeah, phenomenal achievement. And I mean, going into the final uh, tomorrow as it is now over here, it's, I mean, the pressure is completely off. This is a no lose situation for Mona McSherry. She's eighth fastest in, no one is going to expect her to come anywhere but eighth. And even if she's two seconds off her best, like it's cause for her to go home and be heralded as a, mm. a great Irish swimmer to have made this championships. And so, and at the same time, you know, when you've got nothing to lose, you can also be kind of dangerous. So if she could pick off, look, she's not going to win a medal more than likely, but if she could pick off one or two of those swimmers and perhaps finish sixth or seventh and get close to that Irish record, it'd be phenomenal. It sure would. Stay with us, Carl. Let's hear from Mona McSherry then speaking after she qualified Mona McSherry for the Olympic final. 
I'm over the moon, you know, I, like that was the target, you know, make it round by round and when I got the semi-finals yesterday it was just the plan to compete and race and try and make it to a final and you know I knew it was going to be tough, I was in ninth already having moved up from my starting position so I knew it was going to be a push, everyone's you know swimming fast and it is really competitive but I'm just so happy to be able to get another opportunity to race tomorrow. Um, and you spoke yesterday about that last 25 where you started burning up, how did today's semi-final compare to that? It, it swam a lot better, uh, it was you know point two slower but um, considering I got to bed quite late last night and I think a bit groggy this morning, um, I'm not surprised about that uh, but I'm happier with how the race felt so I'm hoping I can pull the two together and maybe swim the fast time will feel like that. <laughs> amazing, amazing. So the preparation will be tomorrow morning for the final. Um, you have a little bit longer to prepare for it now. Um, what do you do for the afternoon? Um, I think I'm going to relax, have a shower, just chill. I might come in tonight for a pad paddle. I'm definitely going to come in and watch Ellen uh, and Brendan race. So that'll be that'll be fun to just be a spectator for the night. Uh, and then, yeah, try and get to bed earlier tonight if I can. <laughs> so Danielle actually spoke about that camaraderie that you have within the team and within the larger team, Ireland. Like, what has that experience been like for you? It's been amazing, you know, like even yesterday I was having lunch by myself and some other Irish person I didn't know, uh, Philip, a rower, I uh, know him now, um, but he came over and sat beside me and the two of us just had lunch together. You know, that's really nice, you know, if you don't have, you know, your swimming teammates there to be able to, to look around and see other Irish people and, you know, sit with them and chat. And I think that's the great thing about the Irish spirit as well. We are very close as a nation. Yeah. Yeah, Philip Doyle, who obviously uh, pulled up a chair at lunch, and she mentioned Brendan, that's Brendan Highland, and Ellen, Ellen Walsh. They both failed to make their semi-finals in the pool earlier this morning, which again, Carl Denny only probably emphasises the point, just how difficult it is to make a final, let alone a semi-final. She sounds very relaxed, taking it all in her stride, and she's going to go out and give it a go, I guess. That's where we are. Very much so. I mean, I'd love to know. I'll try and find out tomorrow if she did actually go to the pool tonight and uh, cheer on Brendan and Ellen. It'd be quite interesting to know if she chilled in her room or she went out spectating. Um, a lot of the athletes obviously are so sick of being in their hotel rooms over here that they actually do go to the events because journalists and athletes obviously are the only two kind of groups of people allowed into events. But yeah, I mean, the story of Mona McSherry, I mean, obviously I'm sure you'd have talked about it elsewhere on the show tonight and having her brother on and things like that. But it, it's a phenomenal story. And I think you know, she is, I guess, the 1% of childhood swimmers who have made it uh, to this level, who possibly possibly had the talent and also had the work ethic. But, you know, she's got that stroke of luck and she's got the support. Like, I remember talking to her, I think it was four years ago after she won that World Junior title and sitting down with her and just kind of going over the year and going over her routine. And she was just going into her leaving cert year and she was saying the alarm clock went at 4 a.m. every morning. She was out the door at 5 a.m. up to Bally Shannon, one of her parents doing the drive and half hour drive. She's in, she'd warm up for a half hour, two hours in the pool, back, breakfast, off to school, whatever it was, eight, half eight, and then back, all her friends would be going down the town after school. She'd be going back to the pool for another few hours, have dinner, and then she's doing homework for the night and then bed at 10 o'clock at the latest. And that was the routine five days a week, Saturday morning, it was one session. I remember saying to her, like, you know, at, at weekends, you obviously have the weekends off, do you try to do stuff, do you try to go out, I guess, with your friends or anything like that? And she just said, look, I, I, I meet my friends or I'll take my dog for a walk on the beach or whatever. But, you know, if, if I went out or did anything too crazy, I'd just be tired for the rest of the week. So that's the sacrifice, I guess, she had to make. And these were the choices she was making at the age of like 13, 14, 15, all the way up to her teenage years. And obviously for most people who make them, it doesn't fully pay off to this extent, even if they get a lot of self-satisfaction out of whatever level they get to. But I'm just so happy. And I think everyone in Grange and her old coach, Grace Mead, who obviously nursed her up through those teenage years, and even indeed her parents and family, it should be taking some amount of pride tonight because it is obviously her achievement, but it's a whole lot of other people's achievement as well. Yeah, amazing. So 3.17 a.m., the Olympic final on this evening with Mona McSharry. To try and jump around then to a few different places, Carl, and bring people up to speed, the men's rugby sevens team have played two matches at this stage. They've lost them both, so they lost to South Africa 33-14. A better showing against the US, 19 points to 17. So they are in action, and I'm given Irish times, by the way, I don't want to confuse you. Uh, 3 a.m. Tuesday, so they're going to play Kenya. They obviously have to win that game now, and then they hope they can make it through as one of the best third placed uh, sides. Then in the hockey, Ireland beat South Africa 2-0 over the weekend, the uh, Irish women's team, and they lost in their lands 4-0. They were 1-0 down for most of the game until about the last 15 minutes, and then the Netherlands, obviously best team in the world, pretty much kicked on and won 4-0. 
it does still leave the Irish team in uh, very decent shape. They play Germany on Wednesday. There's a sense that could be rain affected, but that's where they are. One more win from two most likely uh, gets them through. And then you mentioned Liam Jago. So you were out of the canoe slalom. I was. I mean, I looked at his quotes afterwards, Carl. Yeah, 25 years of... Sorry, I was, I was just going to say, I looked at his quotes, 25 years of age, he was talking about a lifetime's uh, work and obviously it didn't work out for him. He was fairly disappointed. Yeah, he came out of the water, I guess, and it was probably about 20 to 30 minutes before he came down to the mix zone and one of the kind of Irish team managers went down and kind of brought him out and he was happy to chat. But I think it was one of those, you know, I, I, I'm sure most people who listen to the show will have seen Emmett Brennan last night in his interview and the, the tears, I guess, flowing from him after he got knocked out in the boxing. But it was, you could tell that Liam Jagu, after he'd come out of the water, had had some similar moments in the, I guess, the cool down area and just gathered his thoughts because there were tears in his eyes when he did come out. And he was composed, but, it, you know, I guess as a journalist, sometimes you feel guilty talking to athletes and trying to force athletes to reflect on what had happened or what had went wrong in those situations because you can see the, the the very visceral pain that they're going through I guess but yeah I mean Liam Jagu what made it so much worse for him there's 15 men in that semi-final top 10 go into the final he was the fifth man out and he was by far the fastest through about the two-thirds marker of that canoe slalom run he was absolutely flying he it was the best performance I guess of his week you know and he was going to sail into the final and it looked like clock a time that would certainly put him into like top five possibly even medal contention if he could repeat it in the final and then you could kind of see it happening for those watching he he missed or he didn't miss a gate he came close to missing a gate just lost his balance and you're getting thrown this way and that in the canoe slalom and I asked him afterwards like I was like did that little mistake caused a bigger mistake later and he basically said yeah it did it, it threw me off and I was still kind of in panic mode from that mistake that I got the next one wrong and then if you miss a gate in canoe slalom it's essentially game over you get I think it's a 50 second penalty which is yeah it puts you dead last essentially and I mean it was it was also kind of uplifting though to listen to him you know because he said look this I'm, I'm utterly gutted and it's five years work for this but at the same time he's like I'll I'll get over this I'll I'll be I'll be moaning for an hour and then I'll get over it and I'll go for a paddle next week and I'll be back competing because he's just said and I'm going to be here in three years time because I just love the sport and I think that was very uplifting to see you know that so many people put so much stock especially I guess the public expectation in these two weeks but I think for the athletes themselves the reason they got into the sport when they were kids was that they loved the very activity that they do and even when it goes wrong at the top level and on the biggest day and that one little mistake essentially costs you five years work yeah you know they still want to be in it for the long run i gotta say annalise murphy on that note as well um caught the eye it just has not gone well for her at all and we interviewed her maybe two three weeks before she flew out to tokyo and she was kind of saying this is probably my last olympics she was saying like i still live with my parents i need to get on with my life a little bit you know even though she would be of an age where she could compete in four years time so that kind of demonstrated all the many things you're giving up now unlike in london and unlike in rio where she got off to great starts things really couldn't have gone much worse for her so annalise murphy she's currently 32nd in the standings there are 10 races there are four done six to go so this morning she scored a uh, 24th and she had what they call a discarded 37th which is uh, thrown away so she's 32nd in the standings uh, basically she needs nothing short of top tens all the way home now or better really for the six remaining races to kind of get back in the hunt and I mean I, everything that can go wrong was going wrong there was like a clash of boats on the starting line before the first race Kyle which completely scuppered her chances in that race and again you know four years well in this case five years of unbelievable work and then when you're just uh, waiting for the starting uh, gun to go you have a clash of boats and it completely messes up your chances and she said herself it's heartbreaking you put so much into it doesn't reward you I'm pretty upset at the moment so that's where she is four races in with six to go yeah it's quite cruel isn't it and she I think I read a quote from her I wasn't that to say anything today but I saw the quotes and she said you know I, I, I believe that hard work pays off but for me it's just not paying off and I mean if you talk to anyone in sailing, there is no harder worker than Annalise Murphy. You know, she is like talking to her coach a few years ago saying how she'd be out on the water six, seven hours in the day. And if something wasn't right and she wasn't getting the move right, she'd refuse to come in no matter what the weather was or how dangerous it might have been getting and things like that. That's the level of obsession that she's dedicated her life to, I suppose, and dedicated the last 10, 15 years 
to succeed at the top level. And I think it's very, very hard for an athlete like her, who's, you know, fourth in London, second in Rio, to come out here and been getting beaten by athletes and probably been getting beaten by yourself as much. And just to have that knowledge that I'm not as good as I used to be. And obviously, you know, I guess with her, it wasn't truly five years work after Rio, she went off, she did the Volvo Ocean Race for a year. And then she tried to switch to the 49er, the two woman boat. Um, it didn't really work out with Katie Tingle. She gave it about a year. And in 2019 said, right, I'm not going to win an Olympic medal in this. I'm going to go back to the laser radial. And so far, she hasn't really produced any results back in the laser radial over the last year and a half or so that has indicated that she could win an Olympic medal. And talking to the performance director of Irish Sailing just before the games, you know, he said, well, look, she hasn't got the results, but she didn't have the results before Rio as well. So we're still quite hopeful that something will happen, but mm. it's very much not happening for her. And I guess she needs a miracle now in the next two, three days to get into that medal race. And I, I would think the level of ambition she has and the level that she puts into it and given how many other options she has in life, if it doesn't come off in the next few days, I, I would be surprised if I saw her back at the Olympics in three years time. Yeah. Yeah, I get that impression. I got that impression even before she went out, to be honest. So it's a tough way potentially for her to finish what's been a stellar Olympic career, both in London and in Rio. I do want to ask you about some of the international stories because I know you were at the uh, US basketball match, so you picked an interesting one to go to. Just want to mention, though, uh, Nat Nguyen, perfect start in the badminton, 21 years of age. This is his Olympic debut. He's Vietnamese born. So he was against a Sri Lankan opponent today, uh, one in two games, 21-16 and 21-14. Where he is now is he's got another group match on Wednesday. The winner of that advances to the last 16. So good start from, for him. This is what he was saying afterwards. Yeah, I'm happy to be able to walk out the court as a winner. And yeah, I'm very grateful for the support that I had today. It was, oh, wow, overwhelming walking out. And there was, yeah, I don't know how many staffs are up there. I know. My physio, my coach, um, a couple of other staffs were there, so it was. I wanted to give my all for the support I was given because I didn't want to make the <laughs> go back on the bus and I lost and there's just bad feeling. So I just wanted to give my all, every single point. So I was happy that I was able to do that, even though I did didn't feel that I played my best, but I'm happy that I took the win. Yeah. Do you have more to give in your next round? Definitely, I felt that I shook off. I more shook off the nerves there than rather played free and played my style so it was just getting the job done there for me and I was happy to just cross the line and um, now that I have a day to rest and um, light practice tomorrow and um, yeah I'm, I feel that today was a good like good chance for me to test out the hall so I feel that I have no excuses to go into the next game like unprepared so I'm I'm excited I'm excited and quite buzzing feeling now yeah I'm happy great yeah. and you were at a training camp in Bucharest yes yeah. Uh, what was that like when you were there? Did you find it hard to kind of maintain your stamina and to stay in shape and build up the momentum getting to the games? Yeah, I felt I had a good seven weeks, really good seven weeks of practice in Ireland. So for me, it was for the last when I arrived in Fukuroi, was just maintaining again um, my condition and my uh, energy levels and also my yeah condition and my. Yeah, and just my mental side, just to be motivated because I, I'm in Japan 16 days now before I competed. So it was tough. I've never had this two weeks of, yeah, just waiting, dying to play. So I was happy that I just went on court and gave my all today. Yeah. Super. And if you could dedicate this win to anyone uh, today, who would you dedicate it to? Definitely my, uh, my family and my parents at home. Um, they sacrificed a lot for me and my sister. And I'm just happy to give back and just give... Uh, something for my parents to cheer and something for my parents to um, to be happy about because they've worked very hard for I, I'm pretty sure they're working today in, in our Chinese so they're working all day every day so I'm happy just to yeah I will give them a call after this game and yeah I'm happy just to give my all and make them proud yeah that's that's really that's what I play Bampton for now yeah yeah, good man, Nat Nguyen so again he's in action on Wednesday wins that he's through to the last 16 very assured Again, Carl, a lot of these uh, youngsters have very calm heads on their shoulders. They certainly do. Nat, I, I, I remember, I think I first spoke to him probably about three or four years ago. He's 16 or 17 at the time, and he was winning all sorts underage. And he did strike me as a very, very confident young lad. He reminds me a lot of Reese McLenaghan. They both speak very highly of their own ability. And I think, you know, 
as I say, it's not bragging if you can do it, and he can very much do it. He had a bout of COVID earlier this year that kind of threw off a lot of his preparations. I remember talking to him maybe in around March on a press call, and him just saying that he was still struggling with the kind of lingering effects of fatigue that, you know, the normal four or five hours of training a day, he had to cut to about 90 minutes or two hours. So that kind of dragged on into kind of March and April. So I think he was kind of in a race against time to get back to full health. But yeah, all evidence on that first performance today seems like he's back there. He will be underdog in Wednesday's fight or Wednesday's uh, match um, against the, he's number 10 in the world, the guy he's gone up against. So he will certainly be underdog for that. But they both had, I think the other guy beat the Sri Lankan by about three or four points more than that overall. Right. Um, so it's not exactly a mismatch either. And uh, I'm sure Nat will have taken a lot of, as, as you mentioned, the, the nerves and the rust have been shaken off now. So, and again, going out there with nothing to lose, mm. you can be dangerous. A few international stories. Tom Daly and Maddie Lee won gold in the synchronised 10 metres platform this morning. I feel like Tom Daly is about 47. He's still only 27. So bronze at Rio, bronze at London. He's now taken the gold. Adam Peaty, the first British swimmer to retain an Olympic title, dominant in the 100 metres breaststroke. And then the Americans. So uh, Simone Biles will see again tomorrow. She was, by her standards, so-so over the weekend. Still made it through to final, but not her best stuff. And then Naomi Osaka. I think a lot of people are really interested to see how Osaka goes. Obviously, uh, she withdrew from the French Open and then uh, Wimbledon, global headlines, global focus. Uh, she made it through the third round this morning, 6-3, uh, 6-2. Hasn't played in eight weeks. Uh, lit the Olympic flame obviously at the opening ceremony uh, kind of compelling figure a lot of people I think watching her Netflix documentary at the moment and so um, I'm kind of curious Carl she obviously talked about having her issues with the press how was the press conference that you were at I mean I presume a huge Japanese contingent there yeah, it was. Um, it wasn't actually a press conference. It was. Um, I'm not sure if there was a press conference. I think they're doing them like digitally or remotely. Um, but I kind of went to her game and sat, you know, very much down the front and kind of was actually kind of between almost her and her, I guess, management or her coach's box. And it was just fascinating to be that close in an empty stadium and to listen to the sort of. I guess, inner dialogue or monologue that she just comes out with the whole game, you know, and it's, uh, I mean, it's nothing new for anyone who watches tennis. Tennis players are always talking themselves and cursing under their breath and kicking themselves after a point. And, but she did look someone who was still very much troubled by her own game, at least. Um, she made a lot of unforced errors that you wouldn't normally see her in peak form, but I guess that could be attributed to rustiness. But I think what was ominous for her, for her rivals is that she's absolutely coasted through two games now while still playing way below her best. Um, yeah, I followed her out when she came out to the media. Just I was very curious to see if she did answer questions or if she stopped. And she did. She stopped for everyone. Now, she had a... I guess, a Japanese kind of press PR person with her who kind of shuttled her along. It was like two questions with NBC. Okay, two questions with the Japanese broadcaster, two questions with the print media. Mm. And it was, you know, probably 10 minutes more or less, 15 minutes maximum she was out of there. But I have to say she was very nice. She was cordial. Um, she spoke to all the press. She answered whatever questions they had. And just on the press on or on the court then, like I'd never actually seen her play before. Um, I've been to some kind of tennis tournaments. I've been to the paying fan at the US Open, the French Open years ago. Um, but that was my first time seeing Osaka. And I guess, you know, as a journalist, I think a lot of journalists kind of felt a little bit threatened, I guess, by her stance or maybe the whole idea of press conferences being kind of taken to task after she kind of made her stance at the French Open. And I think a lot of people, she didn't earn a lot of fans in the media with that. And I kind of was almost you know, probably on the side of the media that I, I figured that a lot of the questions she was asked were very fair questions during that period that she was objecting to. Um, but I have to say, she kind of did win, I guess, me as a fan yesterday in a sense, because like just watching her on the court, she's the most polite player you'd ever see in tennis, you know. There's none of the, like, she doesn't make a sound when she plays. The, the Chinese player she was playing was doing the the classic wailing, I guess, that goes on for about three seconds into the opponent's strike, which is clearly like an effort to distract them. Osaka doesn't make a sound when she interacts with the ball boys and ball girls. You know, she's always saying thanks for the balls and she's apologizing if she bounces the ball the wrong way. She was, anytime her opponent, the Chinese woman, hit a good shot, she just raised a racket in the air and just applauded in the air and even said good shot to her opponent. Yeah. And at the end, she bowed to her opponent, she bowed to the umpire. She's just an extraordinarily polite, yeah. I guess, young woman. And I think a lot of the rhetoric that arose following that French Open 
thing was probably a bit wild to mark or unfair it, on her. It totally was. She's an incredibly engaging and articulate and very charming interviewee. And I think a lot of people just looked at her statement around the French Open, didn't know much about her and assumed it was an entitled brat playing the mental health card. You know, to put a not too blunt a point, point on it, and that's not what was happening. Like, she, as you said, all those, all those things, those, that politeness, courteous, I mean, uh, the way she treated Coco Goff in the US Open and, you know, let's interview together because she didn't want Goff being upset. She's an um, incredibly conscientious person. It's not that she can't do interviews or that she's bad at them. It's they stress her out. I mean, that's the point with Osaka, which maybe was lost initially. Yeah, I agree. And I think as well, there was a lot of people in that debate. I don't know, my friends, I was probably one of them as well, singing from the hymn sheet or whatever. But like, she, like, how could any of us know what it's like to be in her position, you know, where she has this mega fame level, both in the US and in her native Japan, I guess, you yeah. know, where you can't walk down the street and yes, you're a millionaire and yes, you're on the front of every magazine, but you can't live a normal life. And she probably looks at the next six months, I, I would I would assume, between tournaments and sponsor engagements and all sorts. They're probably laid out for her day by day. Where And you're at the age where most people are only coming out of college. So I think in that situation, when someone's dealing with that level of fame, it's a miracle if they do manage to stay mentally sound and mm. do manage to stay down to earth. And I think she's, so far she's done a, a very good job at that. So US men's basketball off to a very shaky start. France 83, USA 76. Greg Popovich is the coach. He's getting destroyed in US television, just having a look earlier on. The US have suffered a few defeats in the build-up. This is their first defeat since 2004 when they won bronze in Athens. So, I mean, to say they're dominant in this sphere, obviously, is um, an understatement. They're without LeBron, Steph Curry, James Harden, all absent. France, not a bad team, so it's not disastrous. But uh, tell us about this. This must have been an extraordinary experience. Yeah, very strange. Like I said, the only there's probably about 150 journalists. Obviously, it was a popular one. I don't think any of us were really working there. We're all yeah. just sitting around watching the US men. And then maybe about 100 athletes or so, the US women's basketball team are also there watching. And then you're talking an arena at a guess, it must be over 10,000. You know, it's a huge basketball arena, an amazing place. And it's been kind of depressing seeing all the empty seats and all these spectacular arenas that were built for this sit empty. And I just hope that they'll find a use after these games because they're certainly not in use now. Mm. But yeah, it was very cool. Like I wandered down, I was two rows from the, the side of the court and obviously there was no particular atmosphere. You know, the old rule of no cheering in the press box. So there was pretty much no cheering besides the, the smattering of athletes who were there at a few dozen. Um, and yeah, so I got to kind of, I think what was most interesting, like I've been to a few NBA games. I always tried to take games in anytime I was over in the States. And, you know, usually you're up in the gods and obviously there's a 15,000 fans or what have you. But just the silence allowed you to listen in to all the noises of the game. And I think what struck me, first of all, was, I guess, the violence of it. The clashing of the bodies and you know i remember there was one moment in particular when damian lillard got body checked and just got sent sent to the floor and the noise of his bones and his back and his shoulders hitting off the hardwood floor was just like it would send a shiver through you and he just bounced straight up and ran back in defense and stuff and just hearing all the trash talk hearing draymond green talking crap from the bench talking crap during the game it was wildly entertaining to listen mm. to and yeah like the the Americans very much misfired. They came out like, I guess, like the Harlem Globetrotters just spinning the ball on their fingers, things like that. They were dominant through the first two quarters. And then it's just like they went to sleep, I suppose, in the third quarter. Evan, Evan Fournier took over for France and they were, they couldn't drain a shot to save their lives with the exception of Drew Holiday, which is probably the only player on the US team who had a good excuse not to be playing well because he'd just flown in, I think, the day before after winning the NBA title with Milwaukee Bucks earlier in the yeah. week. So... They were very much misfiring, but I, I don't know about the criticism when he's, I'm sure obviously Greg Popovich, anything less than gold will be a disaster for the US team. But, you know, you have Greg Popovich as head coach, you have Steve Kerr as an assistant coach. Like, there's no way those guys can be, you know, coaching mm. badly with mm. the firepower they have. And I guess they've had such a short period of time to get together. You know, they lost two warm up games. I'm sure they're still trying to iron out the kinks. I'd still be quite confident that they'll get the job done when it counts. Yeah, they play Iran Wednesday, uh, which should be an interesting game for various reasons. And then Czech Republic Saturday. So win both of those, they're through to a quarter final. Just one last point, Carl. The general COVID situation has it calmed down. Are the locals being swayed by some home success? I know they're starting to do well in a few events. What's the general atmosphere around these games now that they're underway? 
it seems pretty good. There was a poll out there today that said uh, it was, I think it was 31% uh, wanted the games not to happen, or the most recent poll said 31% wanted them not to happen, and then it was 30-something percent wanted them, thought it was appropriate to have them without spectators, and then it was like 37% wanted to have them with spectators. So when you add those up, basically it amounts to about a 70-30 situation currently, which is kind of in line with what a lot of previous games would be in terms of Rio. I think Rio was only 50-50 by the time the games opened, how many Brazilians were actually in favour of it. So despite everything, it's no longer true. It certainly was true to say about six months ago, but it's no longer true to say that Japan doesn't want these games because yeah. currently the majority of Japanese people want them. And I mean, going around, there is no real, you know, or whatever sponsorship stuff up you don't see that many tokyo 2020 signs so it's quite an understated affair around right. the city the city's kind of just carrying on as normal when you're outside the venues but yeah i've been at the open ceremony the other night there was a huge there must have been about five or five to eight thousand people outside there were what i would guess were about a few hundred protesters um among them at one corner with their no olympics flags and let megaphones making as much noise as they could but the vast majority of those people and it kind of made me roll my eyes to see some of the tweets that were coming out saying that there was thousands attending an Olympic protest because from what I saw looking down on them, the vast majority of people who showed up to the Olympic Stadium for the open ceremony were actually just there to take pictures and as we we're walking in they were all waving and smiling at us and stuff like that okay. and you just felt bad for them really that they really wanted to be part of this games but for some reason they've been frozen out and that's at a time when indoor dining is still open and you know public events and there's baseball games just outside Tokyo with huge attendances and I walked past the concert the other night in downtown Tokyo that had about 5,000 people at it. So right. it's a very strange kind of anomaly, the rules of no crowds for the Olympics. But yeah, the, the people who miss out are the Japanese public and you really feel for them because they've sacrificed a lot for this to go ahead. Yeah. Well, listen, Carl Denny, thanks so much for all of that. We've uh, scratched the surface a little bit on the last couple of days. Go get some sleep. Enjoy tomorrow. Thank you very much, Joe. Chat Cheers. Soon. Pleasure. Carl Denny there from Tokyo giving us a uh, bird's eye view of what's going on. So uh, to the boxing, obviously uh, high hopes for Irish boxers. A few disappointments early on. Kurt Walker got the team off to a good start. He won his preliminary round of 32. Overnight disappointment for Brendan Irvine. He lost to uh, Philippines opponent. It was a split decision. He said afterwards the better man won. And then Michaela Walsh uh, lost to an Italian opponent. She had a very good first round, but the Italian uh, came good. And so that was Michaela Walsh exiting in the last 16 in the uh, featherweight division. Emmett Brennan was a story a lot of people were really on board with in advance of these games. He was involved in the sport and then took time away from the sport and came back to it quite late on. He's 30 years of age now. He took out a credit union loan. He was working part time. He was training full time. Uh, he was giving it his all and he got to the Olympics and he was given a dog of a draw. So uh, Dilshad Ruzmatov, if you didn't see this fight, uh, this guy was a beast. He was scary. He was really, really good. He's a 2019 World Silver medalist. He's a real medal contender. So bad draw for Emmett Brennan. Uh, he posted on his own Instagram page afterwards. Obviously I was beaten tonight. For me, absolutely gotten. We've trained my whole life to be here and ultimately I didn't bring the best fears of myself on the night and that's on me. As always a short heart, determination, courage to try to pull it back but I wasn't enough tonight, I wasn't sharp enough um, in my classy operator. But I just want to say thanks and I appreciate all the messages, calls, tweets, comments on the Instagram etc. Um, it doesn't go unnoticed. Obviously at the moment we are quite down so I'll take a day or two to get back to it but thanks very much. Appreciate it. I hope my story may have inspired a kid or two um, as I wasn't good enough to be in this situation a few years ago and I work relentlessly hard to get here. Um, yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, so Emma Brennan there on his Instagram page. We have Ronan Mullen with us. Hey, Ro. How are things, Joe? That was a tough draw for Emma Brennan. And as I mentioned, Dilshad Ruzmatov was serious. Yeah, for sure. And like from the outside looking in, you're, you're trying to be an arbiter when you see the draw, who's likely to maybe make their way to a podium, who could possibly get there. And even before the Olympics, you're sort of willing certain people to get certain draws. Emma Brennan, like, 
who are we or who am I to say he was probably an outside shot for a medal, but he was basically given no chance whatsoever with this draw because Ruzmatov, while it's sort of a misnomer within the the Olympic ranking system where he's not a seeded fighter, but really, like, you just look at him, you know, this, ma- this lad's a gold medal contender, former world silver medalist. So you just felt for Emmett that he wasn't probably able to... Like, he... It, Getting to the Olympics, as the point has been made ad nauseum, you know, it's an unbelievable achievement for him, but you just hear in this tone of voice there and the message he's trying to relay that he didn't get to this position by thinking the Olympics was enough. And he just, it was just a, it was a bridge too far against this guy. And I would be very surprised if, if he doesn't go on to at least make the final and, and possibly win the whole thing. So Emma can hold his head high and in the cold light of day. And again, this is me saying it, it's probably of no comfort to him yet, but to get the Olympics was an unbelievable achievement from him given the, how stacked the deck was against him and he, he did he did Irish boxing extremely proud and in the space of a month it seems like he's a household name so uh, it's hopefully um, I, like I made the point earlier like he might and there is a sense that maybe this is the end of his journey as a boxer but I think many pro promoters will be looking at him and thinking very charismatic chap and his style would segue seamlessly into the pro ranks so it's just whether at age 30 he wants to have another go but you know it's, it's up to him at this stage he's uh, he's opened many doors for himself i mentioned brendan irvine then lost overnight as did michaela walsh kurt walker got things off to a winning start and we have aiden walsh in the welterweight division fighting 3 30 a.m tuesday morning irish time so uh brendan irvine and michaela walsh what's the bigger disappointment here again were these tough draws or will there be a bit more disappointment here ronan i think for michaela again if you're looking at it coldly very much a medal hope i think talent wise from a long way out from a few years out she's been one you'd be looking at for around this time 28 years old tokyo seemed like this was a, a perfect vehicle for her to get to the get that medal she's a three-time medalist at european level twice in a commonwealth games final and you, you just figured again she just needed a slightly better pathway and that's like there's no doubt in my mind she went into that fight thinking she was going to win but again a seeded fighter michaela walsh was the number four seed and for that you would think you know relatively winnable fight in your first fight instead she got erma testa of italy who beat Michaela in June's qualifying event for these games. So it's not exactly the the gimme you're hoping for a first first fight up. Granted, she did get the buy courtesy of her her seeding, but, you know, coming cold against someone who's who's got a win already and has already beaten you in the last two months, not ideal. So in certain instances, and this is why I'd be loath to sort of call this with any sort of doom or gloom yet, because London 2012 was obviously a brilliant success for Irish boxing but the draws were favourable in the early stages and the lads sort of got on a roll in 2016 obviously we went into those games thinking there could be three gold medals here there's very good reason to think defending champion Katie Taylor Michael Connell and Joe Ward whereas this time it is quite different I think Emma Brennan as we touched on already possibly not in that conversation mm. Brennan Irvine a dual Olympian now, this is his second successive games, but has been sort of blighted by injuries in the intervening years. And this was a 50-50 fight for him, Carlo Palam. You know, he wouldn't have been too perturbed by the draw, but he just started a little bit slowly, didn't settle to the task fast enough. And by the time he'd started to turn the tide halfway through, it was just too late. Once the judges sort of start favouring a fighter in round one, you very rarely see it turn all the way back around in amateur boxing. It's a sprint finish, and that's just the nature of the beast there. But Kurt Walker, as you touched on, I was delighted for him because much in the Michaela Walsh mould, bags and bags of talent like this lad could win a gold medal if the breaks go his way. But he has got an absolutely desperate draw in the next round. Like his first his first round was was difficult, but mm. now he's up against uh, Mirzakal Alalov, who's uh, Uzbekistan, who've become like a growing force in boxing since um, they've kind of came to the top of the table in, in the last decade, really. And like Rizmatov, who beat Brennan, was also from there. So it just shows like they they are the coming force. Yeah. And this lad is, he's, he's turned pro, but he's won the world title. He's the number one ranked fighter. So Walker will need a hell of a performance, a career best performance against him. But you just get the sense like this lad can rise to the occasion and I'm kind of willing him on to do so. That's on Wednesday. And he's had a really tough couple of years. Like, he medaled at international level several times as well, but he had a, an issue 
this time last year, his daughter was born three months prematurely in May. He had missed out on qualification for the original iteration of the Tokyo Games last summer. Um, so he was going to have to qualify later on. But obviously that that hit the, the skids when the thing was called off. But in that interim time, he had that personal issue to deal with. Stepped away from boxing for a little while. Thankfully, his daughter's healthy and well now. But it just shows like he had these hurdles to overcome inside and out of the ring and has finally got here and delivered that excellent performance in round one and hopefully can carry that through and do himself justice on Wednesday. Yeah, fingers crossed. And then before you go, over the next 24 hours, Aidan Walsh in the welterweight division round of 16, about half past three, Tuesday morning, Irish time. What chances? Aidan Walsh is one of the lucky ones, Joe. He got a good draw. He got a buy, just a lottery buy, basically. It wasn't on the basis of seeding. It was just the numbers game in the welterweight division where he was one of the fighters who was lucky enough to skip the round of 32. So he's into the last 16 very winnable fight mm. and then if he wins this one he's basically boxing for a medal in the quarterfinals where you're basically you know what i mean it's it's one fight and you're, you're on the podium so that's dreamland for aiden walsh and michaela walsh few of us have a chance to vicariously root on our, our sibling after uh, exiting the games but she's in that fortunate position where she'll be able to cheer him on tomorrow and hopefully he can get things back to winning ways Aoife rock later in the week as well sort of a crossroads fight for her against a, a really esteemed opponent but Aoife Rock, like if her um, trajectory thus far as anything go by she like the sky's the limit she is improving all the time and this could just it just could pan out for her perfectly Kurt Walker obviously back in Wednesday and then Kelly Harrington who we're all sort of hanging her hat on she's yeah. in action at 3am Friday 3am Friday okay good man Ronan Mullen appreciate it thank you cheers Joe that's Ronan Mullen on the boxing. So this is our Olympic show. It's day three, obviously, of the Games, and it will come at you this show. That is just after five o'clock every weekday evening. It's all with thanks to Indeed, who are proud to support Team Ireland at the Tokyo 2020 Olympics. Indeed believes the world works better when people are given every opportunity to unleash their true talents. Hashtag talent unleashed. And speaking of talent unleashed, back to the main story, I think, of... The day from an Irish perspective, Mona McSharry, if you're just tuning into the show, uh, the shining light for the Irish thus far, 20 years of age, from Sligo in her very first games. She has made some history. She has reached an Olympic final. Uh, Michelle Smith, the only other Irish swimmer, male or female, to make a final. So uh, Tuesday morning, Irish time, 3.17 a.m., Mona McSharry goes in the 100 metres breaststroke final. And I'm very happy to say we have her younger brother, on the line, Marek McSharry. How are you doing? You're very welcome, Marek. Hi, Joe. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. Thanks so much for taking the call. I'm told you've just come from yeah. working on the bog to talk to us, so good man. Yeah, yeah. I have to leave a bit early to make it down, but... <laughs> Hard work out there. Get a finish. Hard work out there, yeah, I'm yeah. sure, is it? Yeah. Uh, it's not too bad now. The heat's gone, so it's not too bad. So listen, uh, for the McSharry family, this is all a bit ridiculous, isn't it? Tell us about the experience of watching your older sister in the middle of the night last night. What, what was it like? Oh, it's, it's great. It's, um, like She's been hoping to do this for years now, and we all know that. And seeing her talk on the TV too, how excited she is. We just know it means a lot to her. So same for us. I'm sure it does. What was the McSharry game plan? Did you try and all get to bed early, or did you stay up all night? And we all had separate ones. Well, actually, we all slept apart from my mum. <laughs> we all set the alarm and then my mum stayed up and made sure we all get up for it. Yeah, OK. And so is it uh, quiet, everyone, or are, you, are we all screaming at the telly? Um, well, we wouldn't. We'd, we'd be quiet enough, but, uh, yeah, we'd scream when it gets close, yeah. So point zero point zero one of a second is what she made the final by. Yeah, yeah it's tight, but... Uh, she made it, so hopefully she'll go a bit faster now in the final. How is she looking to you, even just via the TV? Because um, I heard her being interviewed in RTE and she was saying like she could feel her hands shaking a little bit before the race, like her, as if her body knew this was a big deal, even though she felt very calm in her head. Her body was almost shaking. So is she looking nervous to you yeah. or pretty similar to how you uh, see she, her usually? It's, it's, she's a bit different to normal. It's, um, you can see that it means a lot to her. Uh, it's nice to see. So, I mean... It's it's amazing for Ireland. It's amazing for Sligo as well, and for the whole family. And Marlins and Ballyshannon. That's the club that's suddenly yeah. uh, most famous club in Ireland. All of a sudden, that's where it all started. So tell us about that. So I presume uh, she was one of these kids who's up at five a.m. and in the pool before school. 
yeah, um, she got, she went to school up there in Ballyshan, Clash Conkill. So um, it was handy. It was right beside the school. So she'd go up before and then um, walk up to school afterwards. And it worked out well. And then she could also come down, if she had free time between classes, she could come down to the pool and say, uh, say use, the t use the free time she had in the day. Wow, extraordinary. Are you, were you swimming as well? Yeah, I would have trained with her. Um, yeah, not on the same level, but trained with her, I know. And so, like, from a young age, when she's going that early and, and putting in all the dedication and competing at community games and various things, is it obvious to everyone that she's super talented, even from a young age? Um, well, geez, I'm not too sure, because I would have been younger than her, but... Um, <laughs> Um, I guess so. She was always, she's always would have been always would have been ahead in community games. Well, not always, but you could tell that she'd be a bit different. Well, listen, it's the absolutely usual. yeah. Well, I mean, and a lot different. It turns out as the years went by. So, junior, yeah. junior world champion in 2017, and then over to yeah. the states where she seems to have done really well. And and now, I mean, this is just extraordinary, like history for her and and for the family. So. Uh, same plan again tonight, I think, 3.17 a.m. She's in the pool in the yeah, final? 3.17, I'll be up. So you, you're going to bed tonight again? Mum, stay up? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what the plan is yet, but I think so, yeah. I'll probably go to sleep again and get up before I won't stay up that long. <laughs> I think that's the smarter plan, especially if you're working in the bog the next day. <laughs> yeah, well, hopefully not there again today, tomorrow, <laughs> but um, hopefully get it done today. Have you guys been able to talk to her much? Um, not between the races now, we'll give her a space because uh, she'd want to rest up. There's not too much time between them, but um, we'll talk to her afterwards. And we would have, would have been talking to her before, just a few texts in between. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll leave her alone for now. Yeah. She does seem to be enjoying the whole experience from what I've heard her say on TV. Oh, definitely. You can even tell by the way she was speaking in the interviews. Definitely loving it over there. Yeah. Well, listen. Uh, we wanted to touch base with someone from the family. I'm sure it must be amazing for you all. I mean, it's a pity you can't be out there, I guess, but watching on TV is the next best thing. Yeah. So, uh, Marek, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, fingers crossed tonight, I guess. That's the plan. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having me. No, thank you. Marek McSharry there, brother of Mona. So um, thanks to him for coming back and giving us his time. That's our Olympic show done for this evening. Back tomorrow again, 5 o'clock, OTB AM, half past seven, with all the uh, breaking news as it happens as well from the Olympics. The Olympic Show on OTB Sports with Indeed, proud partner of Team Ireland.